Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight, where we bring you the latest news, information and analysis on what's really going on in the worlds of the bricks. Now, today I want to talk about a situation uh, in, with a medium-sized bank uh, in Russia that over the last three years has made billions of euros in profits and all of it legally. Now, how did it come about and why is it making so much money? Well, it's one of the 10 largest banks in Russia and it's a subsidiary of the Austrian Raffheisen Bank. And it continues to operate in the country uh, and the United States, which imposed thousands of sanctions on Russia and, and other companies uh, that are trading with it, have repeatedly pressured Raffheisen to leave Russia. Yet for the last two years, they've not imposed any restrictions on it. No. The European Central Bank is also uh, has reservations about it operating in Russia, but uh, it's not ready to force the Austrian bank into leaving Russia. Now, why is that? And what makes this particular bank different from the others in the sector that have faced similar challenges? I mean, despite the imposition of Western sanctions and the departure of numerous Western companies from Russia, uh, some foreign banks have not yet demonstrated a willingness to leave. I mean, only the French Socgen or Societe Generale has managed to completely leave, leave Russia. I mean, it sold its subsidiary Ross Bank at the beginning of 2022 to some Russian investors, and that was just immediately after the start of the military operation in the Ukraine. Now, also, despite ceasing to provide actual banking services last year, Citigroup still has seven billion in assets with the Russian central bank. I mean, some of the subsidiaries of other foreign banks continue to actually operate in Russia. Consequently, the Italian uh, bank Unicredit has stated that it's unable to accelerate its withdrawal from Russia for a variety of reasons. All right. Despite laying off many of its employees last year, the German Deutsche Bank has also made uh, more revenue in 2023 than it did in 2022. Now, the main case in point which I mentioned and I wanted to talk about is illustrating why banks are delaying their exit from Russia under pressure from the West is that Raffheisen Bank is the largest foreign bank in the country and it makes money. I mean, this bank started operations in Russia in 1996 and at the end of 2022 was the second most profitable bank in Russia after Sberbank. It also has an extensive branch network in cities across the country, so it's pretty well connected and, uh, and doing very well. Now, the United States has repeatedly criticised Raffheisen Bank for its continued presence in Russia. I mean, the most recent occasion was brought to light this week. Um, Raffheisen Bank International, uh, the parent of the Austrian uh, bank, has received a written warning from the US Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adameo saying that access to the US financial system may be limited to it due to its dealings with Russia. And this was according to the usual anonymous sources who spoke to Reuters. Now, the US Treasury Department has also expressed reservations about the plans of the bank's Russian subsidiary to purchase the stake in the Austrian construction company Strabag uh, for $1.5 this year. Now, if the deal comes off, the Russian Raffheisen Bank is required to transfer the stake to its Austrian holding company in the form of dividends, although that's subject to the approval of the Russian authorities, so good luck there. I mean, that does mean that the bank will attempt to withdraw a portion of its capital and funds from Russia. I mean, the bank believes that this deal will help reduce the size of its Russian exposure. Now, in my opinion, the deal's not likely it happens. It needs a sign off from President Putin, and I don't see him doing it anytime soon. Now, it's not a surprise that Raffheisen Bank is not actually in any hurry to leave Russia. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the bank has a significant presence, making it challenging to just simply leave the market or sell its assets for you know, a nominal price and walk away. I mean, over the last three years, uh, the Austrian banking group Raffheisen Bank International has generated more profit from its Russian division than from all of the other branches around the world combined, and that's according to its annual report. I mean, this year, the Russian and Belarusian uh, divisions of the group will collectively generate another 1.2 billion euros of net income for Raffheisen. 
That represents 69% of the group's total net profit. Now put that in context. The economic activities of all the other uh, Raiffeisen Bank International and all the countries that it operates in, and there are a lot of them, mostly including uh, all of Eastern Europe and the Balkans. And they are expected to generate only 500 million euros in net income. And that's according to analysts from financial corporation Citigroup. In 2022, RBI's net profit in Russia was 2.05 uh, billion euros. In 2023, it was 1.3 billion euros. In 2022, Raiffeisen Bank became the second most profitable bank in Russia, and that's just behind Sperbank, the Russian savings bank. Now, the bank accounts for approximately a quarter of all euro transfers in and out of Russia. Now, this means that the bank plays a pivotal role in the Russian banking system and the economy of Russia. So it's of like utmost importance to Russia that is nothing is allowed to undermine trust in the bank or interfere with its activities. And the preservation of it is an important task for the whole banking sector, regardless of who owns the bank. I mean, Raiffeisen Bank is included in the list of systematically important banks in Russia as defined by the Bank of Russia. Now, the bank oh, does enjoy a strong market position. It's got a good level of business efficiency and a high uh, assessment of its asset quality. Now, according to Mary Valasilvi, uh, who's Associate Professor at State Municipal Finance at the Russian Economic University, the bank's management is not exactly seeking to comply with the requirements of the ECB in order to preserve the value of their assets and the business as a whole for a future sale. Now, it's important to understand that the banks are not like manufacturing plants or factories which can be sold uh, quickly or just abandoned and written off. I mean, these production facilities will still find new Chinese or Russian owners. Yeah, trading companies have fled, but companies that took over them have maintained continuity and avoided any problems. I mean, Raffheisen here, we're not talking about someone like Ikea or McDonald's leaving. I mean, it's impossible to just simply remove the second most profitable bank uh, from the system without serious consequences. And not just for Russia, but for the companies and countries that still trade with companies inside and outside of Russia on non-sanctioned products. Now, it's still unclear, though, why the United States has not taken stronger action against Raiffeisen and limiting itself to mere threats. I think it's likely that the American action against the Austrian bank will not be well received by the European Union. Given that in recent years they've had to rescue some of their other banks from bankruptcy just to prevent a severe financial crisis uh, euro-wide. I mean, it's not as if this, the US hasn't encountered similar problems itself with uh, its Silicon Valley Bank and, and others. So, I mean, if you, given the interconnectivity between banks and operations, it, it's challenging to accurately assess the potential impact of a single bank failure and how it will uh, reverberate across the market. So that's probably why the United States is probably reluctant to take action that could precipitate a financial crisis in the EU, which could have a serious knock-on effect to American banks and the globe, broader global financial system. So it seems that the US is adopting a cautious approach towards the bank uh, as they continue to operate in Russia. I mean, it's not really in their best interest to engage in conflict with the European Union. And, they're keen to avoid any missteps. It could also be the fact that the EU and the US continue to buy things from Russia like uranium, fertilizer, nat natural gas, and payments through the Raffheisen is certainly a facilitator for that. Now, the ECB has made it clear it wants Raffheisen to leave the Russian market. However, it's only demanding this in principle at this stage. In March, the ECB outlined its expectations, which include a plan for winding down the bank's activities in Russia. Now, this could involve the sale of the Russian subsidiary or the closure of the Russian division, but I think that's unlikely. However, the ECB does not anticipate that the bank will withdraw from Russia within the next two years. So that gives you a hint that they're not serious. I mean, Raffheisen says it will begin to reduce its business in Russia in the third quarter of 2024, as the ECB have asked. Now, this is according to Johann Strobel, who's the head of the Austrian uh, financial group, uh, Raffheisen. And I mean, the group's currently developing, according to him, 
a plan of action that will be evaluated based on the performance of the group. And yet, according to him, the reduction in business in Russia will result in a near complete cessation of lending activities. Now, however, the bank is still likely to continue accepting payments on existing outstanding loans. So I don't see that most of those are still going to be outstanding for some time. Now, Raffheisen is one of the few banks in Russia that actually still uh, is able to offer euro denominated transactions, including transfers to Europe and international payments, as most banks in Russia are cut off from the SWIFT system. Now, if it leaves Russia, then Russia will have to create new financial schemes, which will probably cost additional fees and other costs, not to mention inconvenience. That said, however, there will be other banks in the likes of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan who will take the place of the Russian Raffheisen Bank in doing these type of transactions. Now, the, the route says it's working on a sale or a spin-off of its Russian subsidiary, but both options would require multiple approvals from the Russian and European authorities and as well as those countries' central banks. That means the process depends not only on the bank, but the regulators, and I don't really expect the regulators in Russia to be that helpful. Now, Raffheisen has explained that they're not cutting down on their business in Russia very quickly, and that's in order to preserve the value of the assets so it can be sold. They obviously want a fair price and not forced to sell at rock bottom prices. Now, over the past two years, there have been offers to buy from a number of Russian and foreign partners who are not under sanctions. Now, but you can understand there is a certain reluctance of the Austrians to sell off what is their most profitable asset for a pittance to please the politicians in the West. I mean, would you sell off a highly profitable bank you spent almost three decades building up uh, over something you're not actually concerned with? I mean, plus knowing that the funeral will be over in, in the future, and if you sold it and left the country, you would face an impossible task to get it back into the market. So these are some of the factors that need to be taken into account. But anyway, make no mistake though, this situation will be over, and Russia's commodities and resources, which are essential to the world markets, and especially the EU, which used to be Russia's biggest trading partner, so, despite the political rhetoric, etc., the world needs Russia. And better advice to the Austrians. Remember the phrase by Henry Kissinger, who said, it's far more dangerous to be a friend of the US than its enemy. And it's something perhaps the EU should bear in mind. Thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe, like and share. Please visit the website for new articles on BRICS every day. And I'll be back in the next few days with uh, another video. Thank you very much and uh, great. Thank you.